would like to introduce our next speaker, and that's Weston Wilson. He was an environmental engineer in Denver with the EPA, and he uh, blew the whistle on fracking in 2005 to Congress um, regarding uh, impacts to safe drinking water that were available in studies that the EPA was not being forthright about. And so I'd like to introduce him now, if you'd welcome him. Well, thanks, Shane. He's given us the kind of some of the details here in Colorado. I want to take a little bigger picture, uh, look at this whole industry from a national perspective. Um, wait to get my slideshow up there. Um, just briefly, I'll talk a little bit about myself. I worked for 35 years for the Environmental Protection Agency, and in 2004, I wrote a report to the Congress and Inspector General about EPA's failure. It, in that year, EPA looked at hydraulic fracking for cobalt methane and had this illogical conclusion. EPA said, fracking fluids are toxic, but they present no risk, <coughs> which is patently absurd. Um, and the Inspector General of EPA began an investigation of my claims, but the, the following summer, uh, the United States Congress exempted the practice of hydraulic fracking from the Safe Drinking Water Act. So the Inspector General pulled out it was no longer a violation of the law. I'm going to go through some of the, the myths that this industry has been perpetuating. Let's, let's take a look at them. Next slide. Let me talk about how the industry's changed. But in the first hundred years of this practice, when we saw some drilling down in Florence, when we saw much earlier drilling out in Well County, the industry was looking for a place where the oil and gas was trapped underground. That is, the oil and gas had left the rock we had formed in, it had moved up, and there was some kind of trap, typically an anticline, <coughs> a, sorry, a sandy layer overweighed by a shaley layer, and they were looking for these traps. And that's important to us now because they're no longer <coughs> looking for traps. This was, was, uh, back then when uh, the trap, when they were finding traps, they would find often gas and then water and then oil. Oh, didn't say it right. Gas and then oil and then water. And the water underneath would be briny, not useful. The industry, if it produced some of that briny water, would re-inject right back into the same place to keep up their formation pressures and make more oil and gas. Those days are gone. What fracking, especially fracking combined with horizontal drilling has allowed the industry to do is go after the mother load. So if you look a little deeper down here, you see still a shale layer could be bent, but they're going after the gas and oil where it, where it was cooked, where it always has been. And for us, that means, uh, as citizens, it's no longer hit and miss. If you were just off that trap, back in the old days, and you were looking for a trap, you might have missed it and get a dry well. That's not happening. They always get their man, like the Canadian Mounties. There are no dry holes anymore. They drill down into these formations, and they're able to um, fracture the rock under high, high pressure using a wide variety of toxic chemicals, and that guarantees them that they get oil and gas. What's happening uh, right here in Colorado is they really have hit a, 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 the mother load. It's called the Niobrara Shale, and it produces mostly oil and some gas. And here's a, a brief overlay. It's an entire front, uh, entire front range. The, um, Colorado, the U.S. Geological Survey just put out a, um, a more detailed map that I use, and this resource goes right up to the Golden Fault. It goes right up to the edge of the mountains. <coughs> So there's no town in the, in the front range that's not suitable for drilling. And that's really what is, is causing the biggest rub this summer. Um, because previously the industry had been, as Jane had shown, mostly in rural parts of the state. Now the industry is so greedy, they come into our home. So the first myth that they want to perpetuate, you'll see this a lot um, when they're talking about it, is fracking is 60 years old and it's proven, proven to be safe. That's simply not true. This, this uh, unique combination of their ability to drill horizontally into formation and frack it in stages is only five or six year old practice. 
And in fact, that science on this is very minimal. It hasn't been studied. We had one health impact ses assessment going on in, in the state of Colorado. It was being done by uh, Colorado uh, CSU uh, professionals. And um, unfortunately, that health study got stopped by the Garfield County Commissioners once it was starting to indicate some problems by the industry. And the biggest problem was indicating, now it was cautiously said, but it was saying, as Jane had said, that these volatile organic compounds and the toxic com compounds coming off the trilling may present a significant public risk for those around it. Next slide. As Shane has made it clear, we know that bad wells cause problems. Even the industry will agree with this part of it. Um, you know, the, the well, that, like Norman Anderson's case, uh, the company near him was had tried to frack and caused some openings in the pipe and that caused groundwater contamination. This is evidence we have from the Oil and Gas Commission. We know these spills, and particularly spills of these undiluted products that come in, are quite hazardous. And as Shane is pointing out, uh, when this spill occurs, and it's not next to a stream, uh, the reaction is to get the bulldozer and pick up some of the, the oily dirt. But the volatiles, the, the, more, the thinner product goes down to the groundwater. We have a lot of problems with leaky pits. Colorado has tried to correct this rule, now requires pits to be lined. Um, but it's, it's still a huge problem. I mean, pit liners, if they're done in the wintertime, they have problems with the plastic seals. It's just lots of problems with leaking pits. And then we don't know a lot about production fluid management. Let me concentrate on the Niobrara. The fracking fluids that, that, that produce water come back from this Niobrara play are very toxic. So they're not being cleaned up and returned to the stream. Uh, as Shane said, they're being trucked off to a, a nearby disposal well, and they're forever, that water is forever taken out of the hydrologic cycle. Next slide. <coughs> now here's the science we don't know. We don't know what the systemic risks are. What, what are the common risks, though, that are always there? And the question is whether good wells go bad, too. Um, and I didn't see much support for my theory. I've had this theory for three or four years now. But uh, two years ago was the first time I saw public support for this concept. came out of the city of New York's investigation of fracking. And the geologists working on the risks in New York said there might be brittle geology in between where you're fracking and the surface. Enough fractured conditions that the fluids could migrate up, especially gas. Last year, last June, we did get some preliminary evidence on this. Duke University did some studies in Pennsylvania where they looked at domestic wells close to fracked natural gas wells. And what they found was 68% of these domestic wells that were near gas wells had some amount of thermogenic gas in them. They were finding it systemic. Previously, we had thought sort of what Shane was presenting. If we're going to have spills, it's 1 or 2 or 3% of the wells. But when we get data like we did from Duke out of Pennsylvania that showed 68% of the domestic wells had some problems. That's, that's not good well. That's not bad wells. That's likely good wells going bad, a systemic problem. And what we know for certain is this air pathway is a systemic problem. Now here in Colorado, the conditions on these pits, I must say, is very confusing. Um, let, me, let me first describe why they use the pits. When, when they inject the uh, water and sand and all these chemicals, and it actually fracks the rock. Some portion of it comes back at them real hard, real fast, under high pressure. And they'll release that to an open pit. And they're counting on our good sunshine, our lack of rain, to get rid of much of it. And what goes first is the volatile organic compounds, and some of which are hazardous air pollutants. And I had a professor of Conrad Volz at the University of Pittsburgh make it quite clear that we are never going to have the science to understand the synergistic effects of these compounds on the human body. That's not going to happen. Uh, first of all, us humans are lousy guinea pigs when it comes to testing. And we're looking at synergistic effects o over time. Our lifestyle complicates that. I don't ever think we'll get quality science understanding what us humans are exposed to. As a result, I say that much of the health effects actually are anecdotal. 
They don't yet have the backing of the medical science to know if people living near wells having compromised health are actually coming from this industry. But we certainly know that air pathways should be stopped. Now, many of the drillers along the Front Range are stopping their open pits. We are in a non-attainment area where there's high, where we're not meeting the standards for ozone. Volatile organic compounds, once they're mixed with nitrogen oxides that come mostly from cars, uh, create this problem. So most of the companies, the big ones, are not using these pits. But the Colorado Oil and Gas Commission is not ordering that. They're promoting that. And uh, you'll see struggles within these communities of whether they can impose completions called green completions without any pits. I put this last thing down here, VOCs could later condense and have an effect. Um, we don't know that. That's un, uh, incom uncompleted uh, PhD work here. We don't know if, where these VOCs are going, particularly if they come back down in the, in the next rain event. Next slide. Um, now this, with respect to natural gas, you know, uh, Bobby Kennedy Jr., Tim Worth, and other uh, were certainly on the bandwagon, not just uh, T. Boone Pickens, but on the bandwagon that if we produce the natural gas, we get us as a bridge to our renewable futures. Because natural gas, when it's burned, isn't as bad as coal for producing electricity. Well, turns out even that one is wrong. Work by Robert Haworth and others have now indicated that the industry leaks so much methane when they're producing it, that it offsets its advantage to, relative to coal for climate change. So it's another bad bargain. When we produce natural gas, so much methane is released as to heat up the climate even faster than the rate or equal to coal. Now, just recently we've come across some information from the National Oceanographic Atmospheric Administration right here um, in the Front Range. NOAA, the big uh, entity out, outside of Boulder, has a 300 meter tower at Erie. And they uh, produced data that showed, indeed, methane leaks from these oil and gas fields was quite high, some 4% of what they were producing, further validating uh, what Mr. Haworth was concluding in his Cornell study. And all this is, is relevant right now because methane particularly is, is more heat trapping than, than CO2, particularly in its first 20 years in the atmosphere. Okay, next. The industry will, will often say that fluid migration from the whales is rare. And um, a lot of this is just because we don't have much information. But Canadian research was indicating that about 12% uh, of, of new wells have some problems. EPA, of course, I'm sure you've seen this in the national news, EPA found significant uh, fluid migration associated with contamination of uh, domestic drinking water in Pavilion, Wyoming. That has been very much contested. The Republican House ran a hearing last year called Fractured Science because the House Republicans were upset with EPA's conclusion. I, I imagine there'll be 10 or 20 million dollars or more spent by the industry challenging EPA's finding in just this one case. And then I looked at some data from the Oil and Gas Commission here in Colorado, and I found fully 36% of the wells they were, had looked at in one study had thermogenic gas migrating right up at, up at their at part of the top part of the well. Next slide. Even when the state uh, uh, tries to do some a document called correcting gas land, how many of you have seen gas land? I mean, gas land. And, and the state put out a document and said, uh, here, here's the mistakes made. But even in their own document, they verified two of the important cases that there was thermogenic gas in Amy Ellsworth, domestic well in Well County, that there was thermogenic, uh, that is, industry produced gas you know, near the Lisa Bracken property in Garfield County. So their document's mistitled. <laughs> they, they go on to say, they claim some other places that uh, Mr. Fox filmed in that movie weren't validated as coming from the industry. But in this very document, they say these two places were. Next slide. Now, Jane did this pretty be much better in pictures than I have here, but certainly uh, the state is saying that there's not a case of domestic well water contamination. I don't know what it thinks of the couple of cases that 
Jane talks about. What it does say is we have a lot of domestic wells tested, and they're not. Uh, most of them aren't showing up. Poor, uh, uh, showing up as having a problem. Well, as scientists, we don't really choose a domestic well to, when we look at groundwater uh, contamination because a domestic well owner can have some maintenance on their own well that can interfere with those results. We want a truly engineered thing called a monitoring well, set in the right location and we, that the scientists have control over. Um, our biggest problem is that neither the state or the industry goes out and looks for the nature of these problems. I mentioned Amy Ellsworth was one of these citizens that had a, their own domestic well contaminated in Well County. The state of Colorado told Ms. Ellsworth that, that her well had been contaminated by the industry. And the next things that happen is, is typical. She has to hire her own attorney, armed with the evidence that the state gave her. She prevails on a financial case with non-disclosure. So it means none of us can find out what went wrong. The industry can literally bury its problems. Phil hit this a little harder. Um, when we think about how much water this industry has used, there's a couple things to consider. Um, that the water is, doesn't come back. I mean, if sewage water, you know, half of it returns to the, to the river, making it usable for another downstream use. Uh, but not in this industry. And as Phil will explain later, right now it looks like they're stealing it. That is, they're buying from communities and unadjudicated using for this purpose without going through water court. What we were uh, asking was for the state to give us a projection over how much water. Well, the state gave us a little projection, clear out three years. It's, it's not really long-term planning. We've done some, uh, Bill and I have done some longer-term planning on looking over the next 20 years, and we're expecting up to 100,000 wells to get this Niagara Barrel oil out. As you saw from Shane's slide, you know, it, it could be everywhere that they have the right to drill, and they can't be that denied that right to drill. So we're looking at an amount of water equal to the, or larger than the city of Denver. So we're trying to compare it to what communities use. The industry and the state are trying to compare it to the total water use. Now let's, let's get to why many of you might be here. What we're struggling with is whether communities and counties can do anything about this. The current condition in Colorado law is the state has passed a state legislation that preempts communities from having a significant role. Now this is being challenged uh, by some more creative communities. Uh, Boulder just passed the moratorium. Gunnison County has tried to do some additional rules. Longmont has an interesting new rule coming out as of last Friday. But it all contends with the state's authority. The state is saying, we're the sole entities regulating this industry. As long as they get, the industry gets an application to drill and we permit it, no community can stop it. Or even improve it, perhaps. And Bill will get into more of that, particularly on a bill that would make this even harsher, currently standing in the state legislature. But I put down some interesting things here. Uh, Longmont last Friday tried to do a ban within residential areas. It's pretty creative. We'll see if it holds up. Uh, Gunnison is trying to get a setback greater than the current setback. The setback is only 150 feet from a building or, or a school if you're in a rural setting, and just 350 feet if you're in a residential area. And various communities are trying to get closed loop. The state land board just imposed a, a complete closed loop, right, Sonia, on the Lowry bombing range. So that is, we're not going to see these open pits at that particular setting. What I don't see yet is obligating this industry to clean up back to existing conditions. Certainly when Shane is talking about spills that occur and make it to the groundwater, it's just left there. My wife is here with me today, Allison, hold up your hand. Uh, we, we would just took a little hike uh, this Sunday, and we got to see some of the Suncor activity. I'm sure you've seen this in the paper. Now, in, in the case of Suncor operating a refinery, it is subject to federal law. So their spill, um, even though the state wasn't responding to a spill that caused a high benzene con concentration in Sand Creek, right where it hits the Platte River, that spill, EPA could come out and impose a solution. And her and I got to see just how significant it is if you're actually going to stop groundwater that's been contaminated from the 
reaching a river, we saw a vast, huge machine drilling a 30-foot deep trench in one pass, a machine that would be six or seven times bigger than this building. It, took an, it takes an enormous effort once the, the contamination has reached the groundwater. In this case, EPA is requiring the company to cut off the groundwater by digging a trench and putting clay in and stopping the groundwater and then cleaning it up before it's returned. It just shows you what kind of controls can take place on spills, but this particular industry, the oil and gas exploration and production industry, is exempt from the Safe Drinking Water Act, the Clean Water Act, CERCLA, the, the um, Comprehensive Environmental Regulatory and Liability Act that is exempt from liability. Okay, next slide. I've kind of mentioned this. Boulder County is now in a moratorium. We'll see where that goes. Longmont has this interesting ban it's trying to oppose, at least for drilling within residential areas. Colorado Springs is in a moratorium. Commerce City is taking a time out. Gunnison County is trying for a much greater setback. Last slide. This is the most difficult one to explain. Uh, I know a number of us have been to uh, Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, process called democracy school which is teaching us how to have communities establish their constitutional rights to home rule and, and actually ban this industry. It requires much additional debate. You should be encouraged by this. Pittsburgh and some other communities have done it. In fact, um, so far Pittsburgh's total ban which bans current drilling and even anybody who owns a lease cannot uh, exploit natural gas within that city has not been challenged yet. And we're looking at something called the Doctrine of Sustainable uh, uh, Due Process, trying to take advantage of some features of one particular Supreme Court law that seems to limit, uh, in, in my mind at least, it limits whether corporations can succeed in takings if a community has just simply banned that commercial activity based on the their perceived obligation to protect public health and safety. This is a very controversial arena. I invite lots of questions about it afterwards if you're interested in that or how a community can be more aggressive and not just simply uh, take the state's one-size-fits-all solution. I thank you. Are you going to introduce Phil? Thank you. Perspective. Um, Wait to get my slideshow up there. Um, just briefly, I'll talk a little bit about myself. I worked for 35 years for the Environmental Protection Agency, and in 2004, I wrote a report to the Congress and Inspector General about EPA's failure. It, in that year, EPA looked at hydraulic fracking for COVID methane and had this illogical conclusion. EPA said, fracking fluids are toxic, but they present no risk, <coughs> which is patently absurd. Um, and the Inspector General of EPA began an investigation of my claims, but the, the following summer, uh, United States Congress exempted the practice of hydraulic fracking from the Safe Drinking Water Act. So the Inspector General pulled out it was no longer a violation of the law. And then water and then oil. Oh, didn't say it right. Gas and then oil and then water. And the water underneath would be briny, not useful. The industry, if it produced some of that briny water, would re-inject right back into the same place to keep up their formation pressures and make more oil and gas. Those days are gone. What fracking, especially fracking combined with horizontal drilling has allowed the industry to do is go after the mother load. So if you look a little deeper down here, you see still a shale layer could be bent, but they're going after the gas and oil where it, where it was cooked, where it always has been. And for us, that means, uh, as citizens, it's no longer hit and miss. If you were just off that trap back in the old days and you are looking for it. I'm going to go through some of the, the myths that this industry has been perpetuating. Let's, let's take a look at them. Next slide. Let me talk about how the industry's changed. In the first hundred years of this practice, when we saw some drilling down in Florence, when we much earlier drilling out in Well County. The industry was looking for a place where the oil and gas was trapped underground. That is, the oil and gas had left the rock we had formed in. It had moved up and there was some kind of trap. 
typically an anticline. <coughs> sorry, about a sandy layer overweighed by a shaly layer. And they were looking for these traps. And that's important to us now because they're no longer <coughs> looking for traps. This was, what, uh, back then when uh, the trap, when they were finding traps, they would find often gas. And We'd like to introduce our next speaker, and that's Weston Wilson. He was an environmental engineer in Denver with the EPA, and he uh, blew the whistle on fracking in 2005 to Congress um, regarding uh, impacts to safe drinking water that were available in studies that the EPA was not being forthright about. And so I'd like to introduce him now, if you'd welcome him. Well, thanks, Shane. He's given us the kind of some of the details here in Colorado. I want to take a little bigger picture, uh, look at this whole industry from a national trap. You might have missed it and get a try well. That's not happening. They always get their man, like the Canadian Mounties. There are no dry holes anymore. They drill down into these formations and they are able to uh, fracture the rock under high, high pressure using a wide variety of toxic chemicals and that guarantees them that they get oil and gas. What's happening uh, right here in Colorado is they really have hit a, 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 the mother load. It's called the Niobrara Shale and it produces mostly oil and some gas. Here's a, a brief overlay. It's an entire front, slope, uh, entire front range. The, um, Colorado, the U.S. Geological Survey just put out a, um, a more detailed map that I use. And this resource goes right up to the Golden Fault. It goes right up 